Step right in and step right up to the buffet table, folks, because we got a heapin' helpin' of hot trash anime on display for you tonight, and I don't want to waste any time before we start shoveling it down your throat. That said, before you dig in, we at Jeff's House of Garbage do need to remind all customers that there is open dumpster space available for anyone who thinks it's funny and original to point out that the house is more of an alleyway, and of course for anyone who asks how our simple and intuitive rating system works. Okay, now that you've been sufficiently warned, this is the hottest trash anime of summer 2022. Let's dig in and please try not to get the fire on your clothes or hair or the furniture this time. Please. Those of you who also have an interest in good anime might remember my recent endorsement of My Stepmom's Daughter Is My Ex over on The Ones to Watch, a raunchy rom-com whose title seems to give away the whole plot, but in actuality cleverly conceals a rare attempt to clone Kaguya-sama Love Is War. Just instead of the whole whoever falls in love first loses deal, the main characters have to use their mighty minds to trick each other into wanting to bone even though they're step-siblings now, because going by a very convoluted line of logic that I don't have it in me to explain again, whoever wants that is bad at being a sibling, and thus it makes sense that they should have to be the younger sibling in their new relationship. Imagine having to call your ex-girlfriend Onei-chan. Wow, it's so much humiliation. I couldn't just, it's so horrible. The stakes in this are super high. So, yeah, it's not exactly the best or even a good premise, really, but Kaguya-sama's story and gag structure haven't been done by any other anime or manga, really, so even a half-baked copy would be novel and worthwhile just for making the attempt, or so I thought. Unfortunately, my stepmom's daughter never fully commits to copying Kaguya-sama's laser focus on non-battle battle gags, instead opting to blend Kaguya-inspired character dynamics into a more conventional formulaic rom-com structure. Which is probably for the best in a lot of ways, considering that what little genius social strategy the show does manage to show us is of the exact level you'd expect from the kind of manga writer who thinks that public boob smushing is a common teenage female bonding activity, and how the tension of the mental encounters themselves is lost almost completely once you realize that every single one is just heading in whatever direction will make fan service happen fastest, with zero regard for the character's internal motivations, or the fact that they're supposed to be equally proud and intelligent. But even still, I signed up for high stakes, high IQ incest chicken, damn it. Not the same fucking status quo resetting home visit, jealous boys swarm the pro tag all the time, probably they'll peep in a hot spring at some point crap I've seen in every other rom-com since the dawn of anime. I don't care if the two leads are surprisingly cute together a lot of the time, and their petty, abrasive chemistry is still quite fun and unusual, and the exploration of why people break up and get back together is actually kind of legitimately interesting. I can find passable romance like that in plenty of anime, and passable incest-adjacent romance, and passable incest-adjacent-adjacent adjacent romance. But incest chicken? That's new. That's the kind of innovation I come to trashy animation to see, and I just can't help feeling let down to find it so watered down in this mix. Although, the show does have other unique features to recommend it by. Features like Akatsuki Minami, the series' cheapo chica stand-in and Yume's best friend, who is not merely random and unpredictable, but genuinely break into the protagonist's house and pretend she lives there in and who has convinced herself, in the space of like two episodes, that she needs to marry Mizuto at any costs, not because she even likes him like that, but rather because she's totally in love with Yume and needs to become her little sister. Another interesting feature is Kawanami Kogure, the show's great value Ishigami equivalent, Mizuto's self-declared best friend, and the only guy in school who wants to get close to Mizuto 
Mizuto not for the purposes of fucking his stepsister, but rather so he'll have a chance to watch Mizuto fuck his stepsister and be there to covertly wingman for Mizuto in case it seems like no stepsister fucking is going down anytime soon. An extremely unique and original character who will probably get everything he wants, considering that Yume has already taken to sniffing her stepbros used boxers in the dead of night. But he might also have to watch Akatsuki getting it on with Mizuto, plus at least one other otaku girl rando from their school. And the Akatsuki thing would especially be tragic for him because she's kind of his nemesis for reasons that haven't been explained, but I'm sure they'll get to it. Um, but it sure does seem like they're laying the groundwork for a harem right now. And why wouldn't they be? It's not like the show's shown any restraint elsewhere. What it has shown, though, is why Kaguya-sama's restraint is so essential to that anime's success. By driving straight toward marketable wish fulfillment and cheap fan service by way of well-trodden plot lines right out of the gate, My Stepmom's Daughter is My Ex ends up undercutting a lot of what makes its own premise unique and interesting. It's still fairly entertaining by virtue of how most of the cast is straight up certifiable and the premise is, you know, still pretty crazy even if they do water it down, but it could have been so much more. I give it three sizable servings of tofu-based incest chicken substitute frying atop three trash can grills that have had more than a little too much oil splashed on them. Still hot and still trashy, but not quite what I was hoping for. Still, I would take it any day of the week over this next one. Far and away, the largest lump of trash on this season's buffet table is Rent-A-Girlfriend Season 2, which starts off with Kazuya going to see Chizuru act in a stage play, and she totally kills it on stage, but doesn't get the next role that she wanted because of nepotism in the theater business, and then he proudly and romantically declares to her that he'll keep being her good little pay pig in definitely until she makes it and doesn't need him anymore because that's what love means to him. And then I don't know what happens after that except for the one good arc in the manga and because I made the healthy choice for myself to stop watching and reading this forever. Look, I've gazed long enough into enough abysses at this point to know what it feels like when they're gazing back into me, and if I want to feel like the future holds no hope, and almost every human being around me is terrible, and time has no meaning, and the only way it's even possible to go from here is down, there's another much better second season airing right now that does all that on purpose for the sake of horror, instead of as a byproduct of its efforts to carve out a cavern void inside my soul that can then be filled with endless figurines and body pillows. I give Rent-A-Girlfriend Season 2 five entire dumpsters full of that one page from JoJo where Rohan's all like, I refuse, which might be on fire or might not. I don't know. Do you want me to check? Do you think I'll be able to find some new stuff to roast in there if I do? Do you want me to make another video because that last one was so hilarious? Koto fucking Waru, motherfuckers. You want to see Granny do another G Fuel ad? Well... Okay, but only because you asked. So he challenged me to a duel, which I won, of course. Then I pinned the card with his soul inside it up in the break room, and that's the last time I ever heard the word union. You got a bold management style. I like that. Although, I do wonder if you'd have been so lucky if your employee had G Fuel on him. G Fuel? That's your sponsor, right? Yep, but I'd drink it even if I couldn't use the promo code BASEMENT to get 30% off an order of any size at gfuel.com. It's a miracle tonic, I tells ya! And not just cause of that one time I drank five cups and saw God, it helps my focus and reaction times, fires up my libido, even stops the aliens from reading my thoughts. You don't say. Well, it'll take more than, uh, improved focus to beat me at my own game. I don't know, I- Say, wanna go smoke some stuff out of a $50,000 card? Do I? Okay, you got your granny ad, but that's it for real. 
I enjoy watching trashy anime because so often it's able to surprise and delight me in ways that good anime would never even dare. But Rent-A-Girlfriend doesn't take risks or break rules or do anything that might upset its extremely lucrative status quo. Ever. In my last roast, I said everything that I ever want to say about the series, and I know that anything that I might ever think to add in the future would fit just as easily into a Love Hina roast, so I'm just gonna do that. If I'm gonna commit self-harm for the sake of content, it may as well be nostalgic self-harm. Although not the same kind of nostalgic self-harm that I'd be committing if I subjected my memories of literal god Satoshi Mizukami's manga masterpiece Lucifer and the Biscuit Hammer to even one more second of Studio Nas and director Nobuaki Nakanishi's long-awaited quote-unquote animated adaptation thereof, which squirted out onto Crunchyroll's servers a few weeks back, prompting many of you to ask me why it didn't make the ones to watch. And the answer to that question is just fucking look at it. The dodgy line art, the stiff, almost non-existent motion, the weird, fugly digital textures everywhere, the actual piss filter they put over literally everything to try to hide how inconsistent the line art and colors are. This might just be the ugliest anime I've ever laid eyes on, and I watched all of Handshakers, and all of Jippy 8, and all of X-Arm, and... Oh, sweet Jesus, Kunin moves! Okay, maybe I'm overreacting. Maybe it's not quite that bad in a vacuum. But next to the beautiful and brilliant source material that it seems hell-bent on ruining, this anime is utterly repugnant. All of the charm these wonderful characters had is just gone. All of the jokes that had me rolling when I read the original left me utterly stone-faced with their limp visual delivery and absurdly inept timing. This is my personal Berserk 2016, and normally I wouldn't bring a show this unwatchably bad up at all because I'm here to bring you hot trash, not soggy medical waste, but I just couldn't stand the idea that one of you might be out there thinking Biscuit Hammer is bad because you watched the anime. Trust me, it is not. You really need to read it. And Spirit Circle, and you should watch Planet With, too. Mizukami is seriously a genius among geniuses and one of mankind's greatest living storytellers, and if you read his manga, they will actually for real change your life. Just don't tell anyone I told you, okay? I could lose my license if I'm caught peddling art. Anyway, this isn't a manga review program, so Lucifer and the Biscuit Hammer, the animation gets the bullet. Moving on, let's talk about another anime that made me feel disappointed, though this time not in something as specific as a story I've dreamed of seeing animated for years being torn apart before my eyes, but more just humanity in general, because I hadn't realized until watching Extreme Hearts that Battle Athlete's Victory Restart was not the horrific outlier I once thought it to be, but apparently represents an entire genre of anime about girls who'd be cute if the animation was better doing weird sci-fi sports things with rules that don't make any sense for reasons that make me feel like my brain is breaking whenever I try to describe them in a sentence. Hiyori Hayama is an aspiring teenage idol with exactly one fan, an enthusiastic middle schooler whose life was legitimately changed by her incredible music that no one else listens to because getting attention on social media is hard unless you're a plant. Unfortunately, one fan isn't enough to keep her career afloat, so her agency gives her the axe, though not before leaving her with an incredibly helpful piece of advice. If she really wants to make it as a musician, she should stop practicing her music and start practicing for Extreme Hearts, a hyper sports tournament in which girls who want to be famous wear special sports gear that cybernetically enhances their bodies 
somehow so they can be good at all the sports all the time and then they do all the sports back to back and sometimes probably at the same time and that's really hard but Hiori is a natural born athlete so she's even gooder at all the sports than all the other wannabe idols who were doing sports but unfortunately that middle schooler who idolizes her has really bad sports memories which are the thing that those songs helped her recover from at first which is why she's a fan now and because of those she doesn't want to help out with the team so Hiori has to hire a bunch of albino sports androids to practice with and then play on her team with her but androids just can't sports good enough to win against idols in special gear. So she's losing the match, even though she's so athletic until the middle school girl and her high school friend, who's also good at sports, change their mind and decide to join the hyper soccer match in the middle. Cause I guess there's no fucking rules. And then she wins, but she's still got to win a whole lot more and also pick up a whole idol anime's worth of supporting characters in a whole decathlon's worth of other hyper sports if she ever wants to be famous for her singing and dancing talent. Does anyone else smell toast? I'll probably have more to say about extreme hearts toward the end of the year, but for now, I give it three locker room trash cans full of smoldering foam hands with idle glow sticks sort of taped onto the pointer finger. Okay, my brain definitely needs to recover after that, so let's talk about a show with a title that explains it for me next. Harem in the Labyrinth of Another World is the English name of the anime adaptation of an isekai light novel whose English name had exactly one additional word in it, which I will leave it to you to guess as to why they might have wanted to take that out of there before putting this up on Crunchyroll. Not that it makes that much difference in the end, considering that the plot of the whole first arc, once you make it past that title, is about the main character murdering a bunch of people to get enough money to buy a slave so he can make her fight for him and also have sex with her. And you might be thinking, Jeff, that's nothing to write home about. Lots of that kind of isekai have a subplot of that variety. In which case, you misheard me because I didn't say subplot. I said plot. You've heard of Rent-A-Girlfriend. Well, now try Buy a Girlfriend. Here's how that story goes in a little more detail if you don't believe me. Protag Kun Kaga gets isekai'd into a fantasy village under bandit attack and quickly discovers that he's pretty good at killing bandits, a skill which eventually brings him into contact with a wealthy slave trader. But not before he has a chance to leave a random love child with a smoking hot farmer's daughter back in that village. Said slave trader then offers him a sweetheart deal on a sweetheart of a half golden retriever dog girl murder maid with massive mommy milkers, who is self-evidently super duper down to be owned by him. So like, if you squint and pretend it's all just BDSM roleplay, that's fine. It's fine. This is fine. Except what's a little less fine is he's only got a week to scrounge up all the gold to buy his slave. And even with his super powerful isekai bonus cheat item, he's not quite at a level where he can earn that much just by dungeon crawling. So instead he goes out in the dead of night, finds some bandits with bounties on their heads living out in the slums, sneaks into their house to murder them in their sleep and cut off their hands like Kira fucking Yoshikage, and then he exchanges those hands with a city cop for that bag, which he uses to bag himself a babe with whom he then has extended graphic and gratuitous pop-up windows, which is actually kind of a genius choice for a censorship graphic. So, uh, yeah. In case you hadn't guessed already, this is another one of those anime where a truck that was headed for the filthy porn warehouse accidentally ended up at a Japanese TV station. So obviously any plot summary I could give you from that point on is gonna be interrupted every few scenes by, and then they fucked. But in between all of those essential plot points, instead of just following your typical Kill the Demon King quest, the show takes it surprisingly slow and is unusually willing to go off the rails. We spend a lot of time just hanging out in the world, getting to know random townsfolk, and seeing what life is like here beyond all the RPG adventuring. 
I can't believe I'm saying this, but Slave Harem in the Labyrinth of Another World has a rare, intimate, pastoral feel about its fantasy, reminiscent of all-time classics like Spice and Wolf and Mushoku Tensei. Which actually isn't as surprising as I just made it out to be, given that the popular early pornographic web novel upon which this anime is somewhat inexplicably based, was a personal favorite of Mushoku Tensei's author, something you can also guess from a lot of his fetish. Now, unlike Mushoku Tensei, I would never in a million years tell you that Slave Harem is a good anime, but I can say with confidence that all of its filthy, indefensible smut is strung together with fundamentally solid, atmospheric fantasy writing of a caliber we rarely see. And that writing is undeniably influential within the current fantasy anime oeuvre, so if you're looking for an excuse as to why your family and or roommate walked in on a pair of floppy dog titties moaning master at you, you can probably cobble together a pretty decent one from all that stuff I just said. I give Harem in the Labyrinth of Another World, The Slave is Silent, four ye old village garbage piles full of plague corpses and rotting fantasy flora, plus scraps here and there of ye old hand-drawn pornography, burning bright in a nauseating yet authentically gritty sort of way. Now, I know we serve up isekai at every single one of these things, and I'm sure you're getting a little sick of it by now, so out of consideration, after hitting you with all that isekai just now, because boy, Slave Harem sure is a whole lot of isekai, right? We've decided to hit you with two more isekai. Or possibly one isekai that's airing twice a week, it's impossible to tell. This isekai, or isekais, is about a dude who gets reincarnated from Japan into an incredible magical world and finds himself gifted with fabulous magical powers that grant him dominion over monsters and magical beasts alike, which he can call to his aid in combat and other scenarios at will. With their help and some other fabulous magical powers he happens to have, he's able to fend off a group of sinister rookie killers at the local adventurers guild and polish off a quest to single-handedly defeat an incredibly high-level monster that everyone else was scared of, making a name for himself as a hero in the process, but also calling more attention to himself and his abnormally fabulous powers than he might otherwise like. Okay, okay, I kid, I kid. I know The Black Summoner and My Isekai Life are two different shows, probably. I mean, they've got two different entries on the MAL database, so they've gotta be, right? Unless my trash supplier's trying to pull a fast one on me. Nah, we know where his wife works. He wouldn't risk it. And if you look closely, I mean, very, very closely, there are some clear differences. I think. For example, My Isekai Life's Yuji is a plain old monster tamer, whereas Black Summoner's Kelvin is, as you might expect, a summoner, a job class so rare and amazing that he's got to keep it a secret at all costs, lest the nations of the world start vying to control his balance-tipping powers. And Okay, maybe Yuji also has a stupidly high magical power level that he tries to keep a secret, but that's more because it makes other people uncomfortable generally and also gives them weird expectations for him. So that means that his reason for hiding his power level is personal rather than geopolitical. So different shows, I'm pretty sure, right? Or, uh, wait a minute. In both, or is it just the one, the main character's first monster familiar is a surprisingly OP blue slime with a real cute, boisterous personality, so maybe not? No, wait, right, I forgot. There's six slimes in my isekai life with adorable costumes, and they ride around on this big, strong direwolf fella who's ironically a big fraidy cat under that facade. Also, they do a Bohemian Rhapsody parody in the end credits that's just 
adorable, whereas Black Summoners only got the one slime who gets real big, and he rounds out his party with a bunch of other different monsters who all have their own unique personalities. Yeah, yeah, it's all coming back to me now. Uh, Kelvin's some gamer kid who gave up most of his memories of our world in exchange for even more OP stats than he would have been isekai'd in with normally, which, uh, doesn't really cut down on how much he acts like a typical Japanese nerd or makes typical Japanese nerd isekai protagonist pop culture references, so I'm not really sure what the point of giving him amnesia even is. But in short order, he ends up finding a new character-defining passion in this world, fighting strong opponents, which he sates by seeking out strong monsters to add them to his party. So that's kind of a fun character dynamic. And those monsters all have really fun and distinctive personalities. So in slightly longer order, he's got a whole JRPG party's worth of voices in his head doing Tales skits all the time whenever he's not out on adventures, which on the whole gives the show a real chill hangout sort of vibe that I enjoy a lot. Conversely, Yuji's deal is that he used to be an office worker who was office worked to death by a company that took his skills and enthusiasm for granted. Who he was before informs everything about how he acts in his new isekai life, and the legitimate trauma of being used up and thrown out like that, which the anime captures beautifully through these delicate, stylized watercolor flashbacks, is a big part of why he wants to hide his power level in the first place. He's worried that if people know what he can do, they'll just use him again. But he's also the sort of guy who can't help making connections wherever he goes, and he frequently leaves new friends behind, their lives forever changed whenever he moves on to a new, strange fantasy locale, so it's not like he's uninvolved in the world. And it's that multitude of side characters who end up getting most of the development in my isekai life story, while his many monstrous traveling companions end up being more mascot-esque than the fully realized dynamic characters who live in Kelvin's head rent-free. The Slime Squad and Wolf offer comic relief and commentary in a consistent voice on whatever the story of the week happens to be, but they don't really come off as having a story of their own to tell. They kind of remind me of the talking bike from Kino's Journey, actually, and I can draw a lot of comparisons between this story structure and that one, although My Isekai Life obviously has a far more robust overarching plot going on with the conspiracy stuff, so it probably won't stay in a vignette format for long. But yeah, that's those, I'm pretty sure, two isekai in a nutshell. If you're looking for a breezy power fantasy to shut your brain off for a bit, I reckon either one will serve you about as well as the other, though which you will personally prefer is a matter of taste. If you have a penchant for quippy dialogue and characters with big personalities, Black Summoner will probably be more your thing, whereas My Isekai Life will please those of you who crave creatively efficient visual direction, fun animation, and strong, dynamic action scenes. At least, I think they will. If they are, a uh, they. I might still be gaslighting myself here. I give these isekais, or isekai, one dumpster full of slightly expired Coke cans and one dumpster full of slightly expired Pepsi cans, both still in their respective boxes and slightly on fire. Okay, I'm sorry I had to do that to you, and after three isekai in a row, you're probably craving a palate cleanser. But too bad, the list's over. That was all the trash. Well, except potentially for Classroom of the Elite, which I've been meaning to reevaluate after dropping it out of boredom when it was first airing, but I haven't reevaluated it yet, so I don't know if it's trash or not. We'll have to find out in a future video. Maybe. I still got to do something about Licorice Recoil, Call of the Night, and Isekai Oji-san. Probably another Maiden Abyss thing, too. But here I go again, running my mouth and risking my trash license. Look. I think it's best if you just got out of here before we both get in trouble. I'll try to do something about the whole too much isekai thing before you come in again, but no promises. I'm Jeff Thu, your trash-tasting guru, getting out of here before the art cops show up. Later!